Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. EM Cases is part of SREMI, Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute, the nonprofit organization dedicated to improving EM care through research and education. The opinions expressed on this podcast are intended for information and education purposes only and should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any medical condition, nor should they be used as a substitute for medical advice from a qualified practicing physician. In part one of our two-part series on cardiac arrest, when, how, and why with Sarah Gray, Burke Tillman, Scott Weingart, and Rob Samard, we delved into the core components of cardiac arrest care, chest compressions, defibrillation, drugs, and airway. In this part two, we're going to talk about some of the finer art, shall we say, of cardiac arrest care. We're going to elucidate how best to communicate to EMS, to the ED team, and to the family of the patient so that we're focused, we garner the most information we can, and keep the flow of the code going like a symphony orchestra. We're going to talk about how to integrate POCUS into cardiac arrest care so we don't interrupt the core components. We're going to talk about hemodynamic monitoring logistics, art lines and such. We'll talk about indications for mechanical therapies like ECMO. And we'll end with the end of cardiac arrest care, calling the code, when we should stop our resuscitation efforts, which sounds simple, but is actually pretty nuanced. So let's start with communication strategies. You know, there's preparing your team before the patient arrives, there's EMS handover, there's communication with your team during the resuscitation, they're speaking to the family of the patient. There's a lot of points in the care of a cardiac arrest patient where communication can go well and where it can go bad. And there's so many barriers to effective communication. There's everything from, you know, disrespect and disinterest. There's environmental factors. There's conflicting goals and perspectives. There's technological issues, information loss. There's lack of standardization, lack of training, delays. There's lack of feedback. Those are just a few of the potential barriers to effective communication. So first, Dr. Gray, what are some of the general principles of communication in a pressure cooker type environment that we need to understand? Okay, Anton. So I would say I have three general principles that I try to walk in with every time. The first one is that your tone matters more than anything else, right? There's that old quote that says uh, 10% of conflict is due to difference in opinion. 90% of conflict is due to wrong tone of voice. And I believe this is absolutely true. If any of you out there have teenagers, you can hear what they say in their tone of voice. It's totally neutral words, but the tone makes it a deadly insult. And (laughs) during stressful situations, we feel this. So the tone you bring is a critical piece of how you are communicating. And here's the thing. There are two critical drivers, right, of team performance in general. Number one is good communication, but number two is psychological safety. And so you can use your tone to increase the psychological safety in the room, or, you know, you can use your tone and bring criticism and judgment into the room and make everybody feel a lot less safe, and that makes performance suffer. So if you want to set your tone to improve the psychological safety in the room, you need to keep it respectful, inclusive, and curious. This means keeping that tone for everybody you're speaking to. And it also includes your body language, right? This is a critical piece of how we communicate. This means no eye rolling. It means no turning away from somebody while they're in mid-sentence. No dismissive physical behaviors, because all of those reduce psychological safety and lower team performance. And as the team leader, when you show up respectful and inclusive, you help your whole team perform better. So that's my first principle. Principle number two is to listen hard. You want to be strategic about making sure you're focusing during communication handover and that there aren't distractions during that period. And so there are several strategies you can use here. Number one, have it set as a team expectation that there are no interruptions during handover. This means your team already needs to be prepped to manage the first few minutes of patient care. And we can circle back to this concept in a few minutes when we're talking about co-led cardiac arrests and how to do that. But ideally, somebody else is managing the first few minutes of that cardiac arrest, which leaves you uninterrupted to get handover from the paramedics. 
This also means your team needs to understand that concept of being below 10,000 feet, uh, which is the concept we use in aviation and in the cockpit, that this is a critical situation where interruptions are not accessible. There should be no extraneous chatter, no other talk going on in the room. Listening hard, I find, also means making good eye contact with whoever you are talking to because our brains focus on what we see. So if you are trying to listen to them, but you are simultaneously looking at the monitor or examining your patient or doing something else, you are actually not attending with all of your neurons. And the science tells us that split focus reduces how much we take in. So you want to actually be listening and looking at them. And my last general principle around communication, Anton, is that you want to bring closed loop communication, of course, but this is both in how you speak and also in how you listen. So when I'm getting that first handover from the paramedics, I want to cross check back with them to show that I've heard what they've said. And you can do that verbally. Once they've given you handover, I can repeat back to them the essential details. You can also do it physically. Uh, in our trauma room, we do this with a whiteboard. So as you're getting sign over, you write the pertinent details up on the whiteboard that the whole room can see. And this is also a cross check. The paramedics can look at it to make sure I have it right, but the rest of the team can also see the pertinent details up. So making sure you're looping back in writing all helps us close the loop and ensure good communication. Amazing. You know, Dr. Gray, in all the years that I've known you and we've worked together before as well, is it is incredible the consistency of your tone, the way you handle situations. I mean, even right now on the podcast, we can see each other through video and, you know, you're talking about eye contact and the, anyways, it's just, you are a master communicator. So listen up everyone. <laughs> well, well, you've also seen me at an evening out where maybe my communication varies a little more, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but at work, I do try to keep it respectful every time, inclusive, consistent. Yeah. Absolutely. So those are great. So those three key principles, I think are, are a really great way of summarizing really what is the most important in, in, uh, in communication in general. Let, let's get into some of the, the detailed stuff in terms of the actual handovers that you need to do. So let, let's talk about the EMS handover. How can we glean the most important information from our amazing EMS colleagues in the most efficient way possible? So like what kind of high yield questions do you ask EMS? You know, most of the time they give excellent handovers. Sometimes they're not so great. How do you redirect them? What are some tips you can give us with the EMS handover? Yeah. So, you know, and let's start with the concept around that handover that is not as great as you were hoping for. Because when that happens and it's a critical situation, that can feel pretty frustrating. Uh, we're going to have a response to that. And when that's happening to me, I really try to think about what the crew just went through and what the scene was like, how hard they must have worked. Because if they're showing up not giving the ideal situation, not giving the best handover, it's probably because they are extremely stressed by whatever just happened. And I know I've given the odd terrible handover in my life. Uh, I suspect we have all been there. So again, like I still try to keep that conversation very respectful. And if it's going poorly and I can identify that, that it's because they're so stressed out, there are a number of strategies you can employ to help them cool down a little. So you can just normalize their reaction. Uh, you can say, hey, wow, that sounds like the scene was really stressful. Sometimes just saying that helps them take a breath. You can even say, hey, it's okay, take a deep breath. My team has this now and let them actively take it down for a second to lower their stress level, which often helps them reframe and start focusing to give you the information that you really want. And no matter how badly the handover is going, you really still do want them. I mean, it goes back to that concept of tone. You want them to feel included and respected the next time so that they always feel comfortable walking into your ED knowing they are part of a team that's going to help them increase their performance. That keeps them psychologically safe as part of your team. I actually have a question for Dr. Gray. I know some days I may not be on my top form or maybe I didn't sleep or my coffee machine broke. And so I'm not quite as compassionate as I should be to my colleagues. So what skills do you use to help ensure that you keep this just this consistent and great tone you always have 
what are the skills that sort of helps you maintain that at like two in the morning when everything is going poorly and you internally are really frustrated about either something at work or at home and it can start to come out in your clinical environment? Okay, so my best tip work for staying present and mindful in that moment is frankly my meditation practice. And I know that probably sounds pretty hokey, uh, but if I don't meditate consistently, I don't show up the same way at work. And I only started doing that, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, but I will tell you that that is the best strategy out there. Some people who don't formally meditate will have other grounding practices, whether that's how they set their feet, set their shoulders um, to keep them present. But keeping that present moment awareness of how you're trying to show up is the hallmark of an amazing leader. And I will also say that because I am a normal human, there are also times where I floridly screw this up or don't show up with the tone that I want to embody. And this is okay. I'm normal and fallible. But then I also commit to apologizing for that and repairing it later right? So if I go home and I know I screwed that up, like when I next see that crew again, I will go and speak to them about it explicitly and say, I was off my game. I'm sorry. I was inappropriate. This is why it happened. And this is how I'm going to try to do it better in the first place. To, to let them know uh, that it's, you know, that it was on me, not on them. And that's part of how I hold myself accountable for how I'm going to show up. All right. So those were some really important considerations for how to maintain your compassionate communication at three in the morning when you're in a bad mood. Let, let's continue with the communication skills of the EMS handover. So I'm always thinking with the paramedics about what the high yield information is that I want to be sure I have before we close that conversation. And in a cardiac arrest situation, there are usually about five things that I really want to know. And I want to make sure I have those details locked down. So number one, I always want to know their initial rhythm and how this started. Number two, I want to know the total downtime so far, both the time that the paramedics were on the scene, but the time prior to that. We want to be clear on their interventions, how many shocks have been delivered, what meds have been delivered. Number four, if I can get past medical history from them, that's often really useful, specifically things like allergies, medications, etc. And then last but not least, I want to make sure I have any details about the family and social situation. For me, that includes code status. Uh, it includes who the substitute decision maker is and who I should be reaching out to if I need more information. And so once I have those details, and if needed, like I will specifically ask for those details, those are the pieces I'm repeating back to the paramedics to make sure I've closed that loop and that I have all the details I need to move forward. And then last but not least with my medics, I say thank you every time. It increases their psychological safety, which helps them improve their performance. But mostly these guys work their asses off in incredibly tough conditions. And I think that deserves a little gratitude. Absolutely. I, I do the same. Now, before we get to communication between your ED team members who are actually resuscitating your cardiac arrest patient, we need to talk a little bit about nurse-led cardiac arrest resuscitations. So Dr. Weingart, I know you're passionate about this idea. Um, I know that there's some places in Canada that are doing this. Most are not. Why nurse-led cardiac arrest care? Well, because it just doesn't make sense any other way. You're devoting a person in every place I've ever seen to sitting there behind a table recording things. So you already have lost one of the valuable pieces of personnel. And their only job is to write down what happened, which is, for me, I, I mean, your cardiac arrest committee may want that information. I couldn't care less. Um, and they're the only person who has any awareness of time, and then the only person with 360 degree awareness because they can't become task saturated. Uh, you might as well utilize that person to do all of the synchronous tasks during cardiac arrest. Every nurse in the United States trains in ACLS, they know how to do it. There's some simple tasks that really offload the doc team leader if the nurse team leader would take them on. Things like figuring out when it's time to pre announce a rhythm check, call for the rhythm check itself. If you have established you're going to give epinephrine at whatever time interval, they could certainly know when it's time to do that. Um, but then there's some benefit roles beyond that. One is they are forced to actually look at the whole code while you as doc code leader vary between having 360 degree awareness and actually becoming task saturated. You go to look at the ultrasound, you go to do an airway, you lose control of the room. The nurse leader never does. 
And then, as Sarah alluded to, for closed-loop communication, we make our nurse code leader the designated uh, person for any request from anyone in the room. And so you don't have to look for someone to go get you another medication or a second defib. You talk to your nurse code leader, you have a closed loop at that point, and then you go back to whatever you were doing, and then that nurse code leader could assign personnel to actually get the job done. So there's really, from my mind, uh, no cleaner, easier way to run a code. Now I hear from people in the community, oh, well that sounds great at your academic shop, we can't do that at our place. Those are the exact places that need to be doing it because they don't have four residents to go, one manage the airway, one do an ultrasound, et cetera. The doc, the only doc potentially there has to do all of that. And in that case, letting the nurse run the actual synchronous portions of the code makes even more sense. That's a great argument for nurse-led codes. Uh, Dr. Gray, I understand at your place at St. Mike's, they do nurse-led codes. What's your experience been with them compared to what's the, the pre and post- nurse-led codes. Oh, yeah. So I love it. I think it makes a huge difference in the cardiac arrest, being able to offload some of those tasks to the nurse. So the nurse is doing the timing for us and calling for pulse checks. The nurse is keeping track of the epi. It gives you back the bandwidth to either focus on the procedures you need to do or to be thinking through the differential and the other medical moves you want. So I find it makes a huge difference. It does take some upfront training. So we ran a number of in situ simulations on this when we first started a while back because you both need people to be clear on their roles, but also to be comfortable stepping up in that stressful situation. And some low stress practice in advance, I think, is critical for that. So if you run, you know, mock code blues as part of your eMERGE training, this is a place to incorporate them. We run a skills day with the emergency medicine residents every year, uh, and we always do nurse-led codes in there, and we invite our nursing colleagues to that as part of ongoing training. Because as your workforce turns over, people move in and out of roles, you need to make sure everybody is still familiar with this. So I think ongoing training is key, but it makes an enormous difference. All those practical considerations, uh, sounds like we should really all be doing this. And now a word from our sponsor, Metricaid, the experts on scheduling systems. Things in emergency medicine have really been under strain and change for the last several months. COVID has exposed weaknesses in our scheduling systems and practices. When staff went off sick or on quarantine, we really saw how thin our rosters were and how every worker and every shift mattered. Whether your ED has lower than usual volumes or higher volumes because of COVID, your old scheduling templates just don't cut it. Through all of this, Metricade has been agile and responsive. Metricade actively participates in the day-to-day reactions to COVID on the workforce. They help modify schedules on the fly adjusting hours of shifts and daily rosters, and making the most of limited resources. By taking over a lot of the new and complicated administrative burden on managing our schedules during the pandemic, they've shown that they are more than just a scheduling system. They become true partners in staff health safety and satisfaction. Metricaid is ready to bring you on board anytime, and I'm confident they'll be able to help us through whatever uncertainty lies ahead. This is great. We've got so many pearls about communication. We've talked about EMS handover. Uh, we talked about nurse-led codes. Let's talk about communication during the actual arrest. So Dr. Gray, any tips when it comes to the team communication while CPR is ongoing, aside from the general principles you mentioned at the top? Yes. So one of the keys here, Anton, is to keep sharing your mental model with your team. And so the way I do this is every maybe five minutes, I'm going to update the team. This is a brief update with what I'm thinking to keep everybody on the same page. And it only takes a few seconds. Often this is going to be something like, "Mm, okay, patients in VF arrest, downtime is 10 minutes so far. Our next pulse check is in one minute. Like it's just a brief synthesis. But then I also use that opportunity to make sure I'm stating the goals out loud. One of the keys here in team performance is make sure everybody knows the next priority. And so that often in the cardiac arrest situation is our priority is continuing to deliver high quality CPR and setting up for dual sequential defibrillation or whatever it is that we're focusing on next because you want your whole team to be moving in the same direction. And so if your goal is that great CPR, you know, we talked about this earlier, I'm also making sure I'm focusing my communication on the first few minutes towards that. 
Maybe that's coaching around CPR. Maybe that's directing the compressor to be looking at the defibrillator so they see the feedback there. Making sure you're actually speaking to your goals is relevant and helps your team focus on them. And the last thing I do every time I do one of those updates is at the end of it, I ask for feedback. And so every time I say, hey, this is my short synopsis of what's happening. These are our goals. And then I ask, what am I missing? And I explicitly open the door or I say, what, am I su- what, uh, what suggestions do you have? But I want to explicitly open the door to harness the brain power of my entire team. This helps them feel included. It helps increase our psychological safety. But we also know that like everybody in the room is a trained professional. They may have bandwidth I don't have. And there are countless times where somebody in the room saves my butt and comes up with an amazing suggestion that I hadn't thought of. Last but not least, when I'm communicating with the team, if you can, you want to keep it positive or optimistic because teams perform better in that environment. And this is hard in a cardiac situation, uh, obviously. And so it's not about making it, you know, fake positive. You still want to have that ring of authenticity, but you're looking for the tiny positive pieces, saying something like, um, hey, great CPR is a good moment, right? It focuses on the goal you want, it's positive, it's reinforcing. Or maybe you thank anesthesia for getting the tricky airway or whatever you can identify in the moment. But spotlighting those tiny positive moments helps your team feel more optimistic about performance and can help all of them elevate their game. Wow, so much to know about how to communicate. Excellent, I, I I definitely need some practice on these things, many of us probably do. And that actually brings up, you know, there's so many great tips there. Is this just a matter of uh, sort of deliberate practice? Is it a matter of doing as many simulations as you can? In terms of training for this, how, how do you suggest people train for this kind of thing? Oh, yeah. So uh, definitely do as many sims as you can. I'm a big fan of that. Ask for feedback. If you walk out of the room and another doc was in there with you, sit down with them 10 minutes later and say, hey, what could I have done differently? What didn't go over well? What would you change? And you can even, you know, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I have a cardiac arrest, I'm going to go home later and think about it. Those are emotionally important cases. And when you're personally reflecting on it, part of what I'm reflecting on is how did I show up as the team leader? How could I have done that better to help my team do better? Like that's a significant part of your role. It's not just choosing the norepi or the epi. Uh, It's all of those subtle skills that go into leadership and communication that can help your team perform better the next time. The last part of communication I'd like to talk about is communication with the family. So first, when is the best time to talk to the family in a pericardiac arrest situation? And how do you actually best communicate with a family about their loved one? So the when question is interesting, Anton. I mean, sometimes we will have families present during the cardiac arrest. Uh, and I find if that's the case, we usually have a designated healthcare worker who is with them managing communication during the arrest. And then after the arrest is usually when I will go to speak to them. And sometimes families haven't been involved. And uh, when you go to talk to them afterwards is your first point of contact. And so there are some ways that we can do that better, particularly if the patient has unfortunately not survived their cardiac arrest. Uh, And so I have a fairly set algorithm that I go through. I want to talk to the family in a quiet room. It's got to have chairs and Kleenex and a door that actually closes, like it needs to have some privacy. I bring a social worker or a nurse with me who has the time to be able to stay with the family after I leave the room. And so when I walk into the room, the family is usually in there. We start with introductions. You do want to find out who's in the room, uh, how they're related to the patient, who the decision maker is in the room, and you want to certainly introduce yourself and whoever has come with you so that you know who's in the room. And then I get everybody sitting down, and I usually start by asking them what they know so far. And I find this piece is really important because you want to be able to fill in the gaps in the story for them. Those pieces of information that the family is missing can be what keep them up at night later on. 
But once you've told them that their loved one has died, they aren't going to take in any further information that you say. So you need to do this first. And so I ask them what they know, what happened at home. I can ask them a few questions about that, establish a bit of rapport with them. And then I pick up the story from wherever they left off, which is typically when the ambulance left their driveway. I tell them what EMS did and how hard they worked. I tell them what happened in the hospital, including usually that we had a big team of people all trying really hard. And you don't need to use a huge degree of detail here. And so, I don't know, for the piece in the ED, I'll often say um, something along the lines of, when the paramedics brought, and I always use the patient's name, it makes it more personal. So when the paramedics brought Scott to the hospital, sorry, Scott, uh, his heart was not beating. He did not have a pulse, despite everything they had tried. And then I say our whole team assembled to help him by pressing on his chest, by giving him medications, by giving him oxygen. We were doing everything we could. Our team has six people all working on it. But despite everything we tried, I'm very sorry to tell you that we were unable to get his heart restarted and Fred has died. I do use the word died or dead. I changed your name to Fred, Scott. I don't know. Make sure you get the patient's name right before you go in the room. That's definitely a key uh, critical piece. (laughs) I can't overemphasize that enough. And so once I say that the patient has unfortunately died, I just stop and wait. Families need a moment to take this in. They're going to have a variety of emotional responses, uh, and I want them to have a chance to ask questions. Whatever emotional response they're having, I usually just listen and then validate it or normalize it for them, express to them that it's obviously normal to have all sorts of different responses to this. So you don't have to fix how the family's feeling, right? You just have to tell them that whatever they're feeling is okay and reasonable. I make sure they have all of their questions answered. And then I usually, you know, say again, I'm very sorry for your loss. And I, and at that stage, I excuse myself to go back to patient care and I leave them with the social worker or the nurse. But as I'm leaving, I usually say, our social worker will still be here to answer any further questions and be your point of contact if you want to circle back with questions in the coming days. I say that the social worker can help them if they need any further information on next steps now. And I do, the last thing I mention is that if it's a coroner's case, I mention that the coroner will be coming and and typically, at least where I work, also speaking with the family. And then I leave the room, I close the door behind me, and I must say I usually will sit down for a minute myself somewhere before I go back to work to give myself a minute to deal with my own emotional response to what just happened uh, because these conversations are hard, uh, they can be triggering And when I go back to work, I want to be sure I'm actually focused on my next patient, not still emotionally wrapped in my last one. And so giving yourself uh, a little bit of time to regroup can be really helpful for that. And that's also the moment where I think about, do we need a debrief? Does my team need a debrief? What are my next steps in terms of the functioning of my team? And then I go back to work. Sounds perfectly reasonable. Uh, Dr. Samard, any comments on speaking with the family? Yeah, uh, just uh, maybe a question to get some advice from the group or maybe a scenario that our listeners have come across is that family that doesn't accept the fact that you're stopping the CPR or stopping the arrest and, you know, makes it very clear that you're not to stop or I've, I've seen scenarios where family members, as soon as we stop, have started CPR themselves or called 911 to have the patient go to another hospital because they're not content with the diagnosis that you're declaring death. Any thoughts on how to deal with that? Because that's one of the most stressful situations when, you know, the writing's on the wall that the resuscitation should be terminated, but family's in the room and doesn't accept that and wants things to continue. Yeah, so I will, if the family's in the room, Rob, I will have spoken to them before we stop. And typically the way I do that is I'm running the arrest, I'm talking with my team, we've decided as a team that we are close to finishing. And I will say to my co-lead, carry on the resuscitation while I speak to the family. I will then disengage from team leadership and go speak to the family. I usually highlight all of the things that we've tried, but the fact that none of it is working and at this stage we will not be able to restart their heart. 
and I have a conversation with the family to ensure they understand and that they're ready to buy in with us stopping. And I usually give them some sort of time window, like we are going to continue trying through one more pulse check and another two minutes of CPR, but if they're still unable to restart the heart, we won't be able to get it restarted and we will stop then. And as long as the family's willing to engage with that, then I find it goes really smoothly. If they're not willing to engage with that, I have on occasion moved them out of the room to carry on the conversation so that the medical team can carry on unimpeded. But that's the pretty exceptional circumstance. Yeah, I was just going to mirror the amazing things that Sarah said and recommend a book called Nonviolent Communication, which is one of my all-time favorite books. Every ED doc should read it. And what that book would tell you to do in those high emotion situations is just guess at the emotion that the family member is feeling and then try to supply a reason. And you may be totally wrong. It doesn't matter. You're showing empathy and you're, by your guessing, you're showing you're open to listen to them. And they'll tell you right away, oh no, I'm not angry. I am sad or I am uh, confused or what have you. It doesn't matter. You've now opened you, yourself up to them saying it. And the one that's often going on that you should keep in the back of your mind is they feel they should have done something differently and they won't name it and they'll express anger at you for stopping and what have you. So I actually ask them that deliberately. Uh, is, is, are you angry because you feel like you should have so done something differently that would have changed the outcome? And then of course, even if they did, you assure them that there's nothing they could have done um, differently because it doesn't really matter at this point uh, if, if they could have, if they did the wrong thing. And that, you know, even though it takes you 10 seconds, maybe years of guilt that you will lay. I often tell families routinely that there is nothing that they did or did not do that led to this cardiac arrest, even though it might be true that they waited too long to call 911 or whatever it is, because I can't even imagine the downstream effects of the family member who blames themselves for the patient not being able to be resuscitated. So much great stuff to take in there and to practice and to think about and to reflect on. Absolutely. All right. I'd like to switch gears from communication to integrating POCUS into cardiac arrest care. And we've touched on this in the first part uh, of the podcast, but there's a lot more to talk about. All of this that we're going to talk about is assuming that you have very good POCUS skills, of course, because if you don't have very good POCUS skills, you probably should not be integrating POCUS very much into your cardiac arrest care. Now, there are many uses for POCUS during cardiac arrest. There's diagnosing reversible causes. There's assessing quality of chest compressions. There's identifying fine VF. There's helping to predict ROSC. Those are just a few. The problem is that you can get carried away with POCUS at the expense of more important things like high-quality chest compressions and defibrillation. We've probably all seen that happen. We did cover PEA arrests with Dr. Samard and Dr. Weingart in a previous EM cases ep episode. So I'll refer EM cases to that episode for details of PEA and pseudo PEA. But let's let's talk through some of these things. So, Dr. Samard, in a general sense, how do you integrate POCUS efficiently and effectively into your cardiac arrest resuscitation flow? And I think this is the big piece. This is the part where, you know. POCUS can't be an afterthought during a cardiac arrest. You can't be on one stream and then all of a sudden say, oh, we should do a POCUS. It's got to be thought of. It's got to be set up. It's got to be ready to go when you're ready to use it. That will definitely limit interruptions in CPR, and you'll be ready to use it efficiently and effectively during your cardiac arrest. So let's set up how you're going to do that. So if you're going to use POCUS in cardiac arrest, you're going to get your machine set. You're going to get the probe that you want selected and ready to go. You're going to get that probe with gel on it, and you're going to be getting ready to place it where you want to place it to answer your question that you're going to answer during the maximum of 10 seconds you have during the pulse check. And one of the ways to get everyone on the same page is you're going to give your countdown just before your pulse check is going to occur so that your person doing the ultrasound either already has the image generated with the 10 seconds left before you do the pulse check or is ready to get that image generated immediately when the pulse check starts. So as the rest of the team is doing the rhythm check and the pulse check, the person doing the ultrasound is generating that image, 
having their finger on the record button, recording their image so that when chest compressions start again, you've recorded what you saw so that you can reevaluate it and look at it while chest compressions start after the 10 second pulse check. So you're not interrupting CPR more than you need to. So that first and foremost is how you become efficient at getting your poke is done during your pulse check. You have to be ready to act in it. It cannot be an afterthought. So let's talk about the things that POCUS can help you with. So for the reversible causes, the H's and T's, that's something that POCUS can really help you with. The cardiac tamponades, the PEs, the tension pneumothorax. And one of the ways to really quickly rule this out, and one thing that's often forgotten is that if you have an obstructive form of shock, which the three causes that I mentioned are obstructive forms of shock, your IVC should be distended. Your heart's under obstruction, so therefore flow is not going into the heart. And therefore, if your IVC is not distended and you have a collapsing IVC, the chances of you having obstructive shock is very low. So one of the things I look for is is my IVC distended or not? And that's something that you can look at while someone's doing CPR. You can have the ultrasound already generating that image because CPR shouldn't really affect your ability to generate a vision of the IVC. And if you're seeing a very plethoric looking IVC that's not collapsing much, that brings in the possibility of obstructive shock. And if you really want to confirm that, you can do that during the pulse check to confirm that CPR is not artificially dilating up your IVC. And if during your pulse check, you see a large IVC the realm of obstructive shock is a possibility. And now you can start looking for your tension pneumothoraxes, your pericardial tamponades, your RV being dilated to suggest a large PE causing instability, causing cardiac arrest. So that's one of the things that you can easily do to quickly rule out an obstructive form to your shock. Your tamponade is something that you're probably gonna have to have CPR stop for you to see. Maybe you might be able to get a good subxiphoid view during CPR so that you can see if there's fluid around the heart. For your RV strain, obviously to get a personal long or a apical four chamber view or a personal short view, you're going to need access to the chest and you really can't do that when someone's doing CPR. So those are going to have to be done during your 10 second pulse check. For pneumothorax scans, you should easily be able to do that during your CPR. You should be able to evaluate the lungs, look for lung sliding, look for comet tails. You can even see a lung point if you have a pneumothorax. So those are some helpful things that you can look for while CPR is going on. So Try to do the things you can look for while CPR is going on so that you're only doing the things that you need CPR to stop for during the 10 second pulse check. We had alluded to before patients waking up in the middle of, uh, of doing chest compressions. There's some people out there that suggest doing no pulse checks and just keep on doing chest compressions until the patient wakes up. Maybe an asystole or V-fib. Like, I don't think someone who has V-fib on the monitor has a pulse. So if you're seeing V-fib on the monitor, you should be thinking, defibrillate that now. And I mean, if you're doing a, uh, if you're got the monitor set up properly on the patient and you're seeing that they're in asystole, you're not going to have a pulse with asystole. So I think that's a time where you can forego checking a pulse check. But if you have PEA on the monitor, or if you have VTAC on the monitor, you can have pulses with those. And that changes management with what you're going to do. So I definitely do recommend you take a pulse check in those scenarios. So Dr. Samard, we, we want our pulse checks to be as short as possible. You've authored several papers on the POCUS pulse check rather than doing it manually. We've talked about this before on EM cases. Just remind our listeners why do a POCUS pulse check and why it's advantageous. Yeah, so I don't know how your listeners are in feeling for pulses, but there's multiple studies out there that say the manual feeling for pulses, healthcare professionals suck at doing. We just are no good at it. There's studies that have been done in the early 90s, early 2000s that say it's about a coin toss in terms of how good we are, about 54% in terms of whether we get it right or not. So we're not great at feeling for pulses. And you can imagine that if a pulse is weak or if you have the typical patient who has a cardiac arrest who's going to be quite obese and quite elderly, you're probably not going to be even as good in those situations. So using all of our resources, such as having an ultrasound, which is readily available in almost every emergency department, might be the right tool to use. And there's a couple of ways to do it. 
Um, one of the things that I really like about the pulse check is it helps me localize exactly where the pulse is, where that carotid artery or the femoral artery is, so that once I see where that is, I can put my fingers right there on the patient, and lo and behold, I might actually feel a pulse that I couldn't feel before because now I know exactly where to pinpoint it, and then I can say, oh yeah, I'm feeling a pulse. We have raw OSC, and that definitely changes what we're going to do next. So I can see the utility in using ultrasound solely for that purpose of locating where I'm going to put my fingers to feel a pulse. And you can do this over the femoral artery. You can do this over the carotid. Your choice, depending where you are, if you're at the head of the bed or if you're at the foot of the bed. Most of the time, if I'm running the arrest, I'm at the foot of the bed. So I'll just take a look at the femoral pulse and feel for it there. If I'm, you know, low resources in my area that I'm in, I might be at the head of the bed dealing with the airway. So I'll just look at the carotid. Or if I have somebody who can do it for me, I'll get them to do it and I'll help interpret it at the foot of the bed. So whether you're at the foot of the bed or the head of the bed, you can get this done. So the technique is you're going to place the probe over the femoral artery or the carotid artery, and you're going to identify, you're going to have the vein and the artery side by side, and you're just going to give a little bit of pressure, just enough to collapse the vein. So if the IJ collapses, if the carotid collapses with the IJ, then you know that you're in a low flow system. The the IJ will always collapse because it's a low flow system. So if you put gentle pressure on it and your IJ collapses, and your carotid collapses, that means your carotid is under a low flow system. There's no output. There's no flow through that carotid. It's collapsing. It's not pulsating. That patient truly does not have a pulse. If you go and you put gentle pressure on your IJ and your IJ collapses and your carotid doesn't, and your carotid starts winking at you because it's pulsating, that's a sign that your carotid pulse is still under a high flow setting, which it should be, meaning that there's output meaning that this patient is getting flow through their carotid, meaning that they're perfusing their brain. And that's a patient where that is quite different from being completely pulseless and you have a pulseless finding on your ultrasound. Put your probe right where that carotid is and see if you feel a pulse there. If you feel a pulse, you have a ROSC. If you don't feel a pulse, then it becomes a bit controversial as to what to do next. Some people don't feel comfortable stopping CPR unless they actually feel a pulse, knowing the limitations of pulse checks manually. Some people do feel comfortable stopping CPR and doing all the other things that they feel would be right, such as starting an infusion of norepinephrine so that everyone in that room can feel a pulse. And I can tell you in many of those situations, if I have PEA on the monitor, I see that the carotid is pulsating and I get them to run a norepinephrine infusion, 10 micrograms per minute. Within a minute, everyone's feeling that carotid pulse and everyone can then be reassured, take that big breath in that we actually do have a pulse present. And then we can look at what's causing this patient's severe shock state and start treating the patient for what they really are, a severe shock state and not a cardiac arrest state. So that's how POCUS can really help when you're doing a POCUS pulse check during these cardiac arrest cases. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we talked about that in our PEA and pseudo-PEA arrest episode, uh, so I do recommend that listeners check that out. Um, I want to move on to prognostication using POCUS in cardiac arrest, so predicting ROSC and predicting survival. The 2020 AHA guidelines recommend against the use of POCUS for prognostication during CPR because of lack of high-quality evidence. Dr. Samard, what's your take on using POCUS to help predict ROSC and survival after cardiac arrest? Yeah, so I have a different take than ILCOR and the 2020 guidelines. I think that there is a place for ultrasound and cardiac arrest for termination and prognosis. I think that if you're looking for that, you know, randomized control trial of ultrasound versus no ultrasound, like those studies don't exist. In fact, I'll be very honest with you, there's not a lot of these high quality POCUS studies out there that are really going to turn the heads of ILCOR that are going to make these strong level one recommendations for things. It's just the way that it is. And that's something that we have to accept. But people who are POCUS savvy know that POCUS can be used as a data point. And I want to emphasize that, you know, I don't think there's any scenario where POCUS alone is going to drive management. You have to use everything and use POCUS as just one of those data points and use other things. You got to use your brain. You got to look at the entire situation, look at the monitor, look at the rhythm, use your POCUS. And then as an overall picture, you're going to make a decision. So if you're seeing, you know, end titles of eight asystole on the monitor and you do an ultrasound of the patient's heart and they're in complete standstill. You look at their pocus of their pulse and their carotid completely collapses with the IJ. 
and this patient's been down for 30 minutes and they're elderly with multiple comorbidities, you're using ultrasound as that data point to say, you know what, this is also pointing us in the direction of let's terminate. This prognosis is very poor. And that's another data point to help you out. There's a couple of problems with using ultrasound for those purposes. And let me highlight that in the studies that they show. Sometimes there's just very, very long pauses that occur when people do POCUS. And that is one of the detriments to why there's not strong recommendations to use ultrasound. Also, POCUS training is not standardized. How one person is trained in POCUS may be different from others. Some people may have significant POCUS training where other people might just be like, say, certified in POCUS, where some people might have taken a weekend course, where someone might have just been experienced and used it and has been shown a few things and then use it to help them in their management. So it's a very wide differential in terms of how, how much training people have in their expert level and their experience level. And that confidence level of how they are with POCUS doesn't necessarily match with how experienced they are with POCUS or how good they are with POCUS. So that's another little bit of an issue. And the final thing is, is that how people interpret images, specifically things like cardiac standstill, there's a big discrepancy with. There's been studies to show that some people call flicker standstill. And there's a big discrepancy and misinterpretation in what one doctor says is what they see on the image and what the other doctor says. And there's interrelator reliability. So that's part of the other issue with POCUS. And that is sometimes what leads to why there's these strong recommendations from ILCOR and the ACLS guidelines. So things to keep in mind. But if you're well-trained in POCUS and you know how to use it, use it as a data point. If you're seeing a vigorously contracting heart, That is a sign that the heart is beating. You can physically see that. And then you're going to use your mind as to say, what is the differential for this? Is my patient profoundly hypovolemic and I got a hyperdynamic heart right now and that I need to fill the, fill the, the heart up and fill the tank up. You know, if your heart's barely moving, is there a differential to that that can help you out? So I don't think we shouldn't be using it. I just think that we should be using it to help us as a data point to make us think a bit more as to what we can do to do the right things. I find POCUS helps me get to the answer quicker to do the right things faster on the patient to help them out. All right. That segues nicely actually into when to stop the code. Now, this sounds like a simple question. But as you'll hear, it's actually quite a complex decision to know when to stop doing chest compressions. But before we do that, a quick message from one of our sponsors, Med Mastery. Do you want to solve over 90% of your patients' problems without the help of a more senior colleague? Then check out Med Mastery, an award-winning online learning platform where you can learn powerful skills like ultrasound, EKG, or CT imaging, to name a few. An affordable subscription gives you access to a wealth of over 80 peer-reviewed and CME-accredited courses taught by world-class experts and endorsed by the British Medical Association. If you're an educator teaching residents or advanced practice providers, definitely check out their group subscription. It's great for bringing you and your team up to speed on the most important clinical skills. They're offering a special 15% discount for EM Cases listeners waiting for you at www.medmastery.com slash emcases. That's www.medmastery.com slash emcases. Check out Med Mastery today. Now there's the BLS rule for termination based on three criteria that has a 99.8% predictive value. So number one is EMS did not witness the arrest, which is the vast majority of patients. Number two is no shock was delivered prior to transport. And number three is there was a failure to obtain ROSC prior to transport. And then there's the ED termination of resuscitative efforts in cardiac arrest criteria for physiologic futility. It's a bit of a mouthful. But these ED criteria are basically the BLS rule I just mentioned plus cardiac standstill on POCUS or an end title CO2 of less than 10 to 15 after 20 minutes of standard ACLS. Again, this approach of the timing of calling a code is to swap CPR after 20 minutes based on BLS termination criteria, POCUS cardiac standstill, and a really low end title CO2. So Dr. Weingart, what are your thoughts on this so-called 20-minute rule What are some of the other things that we need to take into consideration to know when to stop a code? 
I mean, you must know by now, by my general attitude, that I don't like rules that much. Um, you know, it's, it's fine for guidance. For me, it really is what was the patient's pre-existing status before the arrest. And like, we're forced in the United States. I don't, I don't think you guys have these same uh, directives in Canada, but we're not allowed to use doctor discretion to terminate resuscitations in the U.S. for most places. So you, even the 98-year-old uh, end-stage dementia patient, we have to give some effort. But that arrest should be terminated as quickly as possible. That is not a viable arrest candidate. And I'm sorry if I sound paternalistic, but that's not what CPR was created for. On the other hand, if you get a young patient who is viable pre-arrest, I'm going to run that code an incredibly long amount of time. And if you look at the in-hospital data, the longer you run it, the more survivors you get. And so I, I don't like rules. I, I think it's a good guideline, but I'm going to go by the actual milieu of the arrest. And some of them I'll run for an hour. Dr. Weingart, can you give us some examples? You know, there's the hypothermic patient, you say the young patient, but just give me some examples of some patients that you would not stop CPR beyond the, you know, the obvious hypothermia patient. Yeah, the, uh, one of the big ones is intermittent ROSC. If they have periods of ROSC, it really resets the clock quite significantly uh, for how long they could go. I think the outer limit in most of the literature right now for low flow state, meaning you know they've had CPR as their only perfusion to the brain, is somewhere around 45 to 47 minutes. Um, if they've had intermittent periods of ROSC, it really becomes difficult to say at which point to stop. So it, it really depends. Uh, that's that's one scenario. If you have the capability of doing eCPR, then that time really spreads out, maybe up to something like 80 or 90 minutes. Um, so those are really two of the scenarios, uh, aside from the ones we've already mentioned. So the one thing that just is actually more confusion, not more clarity, Dr. Samar touched on it briefly when talking about the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound sort of as a one tool is the flickering heart. And it's what I find sometimes the most challenging is you have this patient, you're at 35 minutes, because then, yeah, I'll use all these, this other information, I'll use their entire CO2, I'll use their point of care ultrasound. And I'm never entirely sure what to do when I see the valves move a bit, the heart flicker a bit, but that's not something that truly is getting a great cardiac output. My... I sort of fall into the same camp as Scott and putting all the pieces together there there and what they were like beforehand. But I do start to lean, especially after 30 minutes is my sort of gestalt for when the rest has gone on for a prolonged period of time. So I add an ultrasound, get some consternation around the flickering heart, and then include what's happening with the pulses. But that may, the pulse check either tactilely or ultrasonically. That's not how you say it, may help add that extra bit of peace. But that's, I think that's also the biggest challenge I've had integrating point of care ultrasound is how do you integrate this information that you otherwise, you would not have known if you didn't have point of care ultrasound. There wasn't a pulse there. They've been in a PEA rhythm and now you see the valves move and it's 35 minutes out. And I find that a bit of a challenge. Yeah, so... One of the things that I would say is, you know, there's studies out there that say if you're in a non-shockable rhythm and you see true standstill, so we're not talking flicker, we're talking true standstill, I think that's a lot clearer as to that's a major data point towards the termination side of things. You know, there have been, from that initial paper that came out in 2001 by Blavis that said, you know, 76 consecutive patients, all of them died in the emergency department, positive predictive value of 100%. There have been some papers that show it's not 100%, but it's near close to 100%. The problem becomes when you start to see things that aren't standstill, and that wasn't studied in the paper. That's something completely different. What I will say is what you're describing as a patient who has a barely moving heart that's just barely flickering, there's a little bit of movement of stuff. That, although not standstill, is still a very, very poor moving heart and is a overall bad prognosis. You'd rather see something moving a lot more. But at the same time, it's not enough to be, you know, a slam dunk, we're going to stop. It's something to say, okay, you know what, the heart's barely moving and we've been doing this for 35 minutes. What more do I have to offer this patient? What other things can I consider doing? What things haven't I reversed that I can reverse? What other interventions can I do to help this patient? I would say it's more of a data point to say, 
you know, this is on the side of a more poor prognosis. And is there anything I can do that I haven't done yet to keep keep this code going? Um, so I would say it's helpful to know that that heart's not vigorously beating, but it's not, as the Eocore would say, a prognostic feature that we know much about here in 2022. I can't tell you what a flickering heart means in terms of how many of those patients are going to have a meaningful ROSC and neurological survival and how many of those people are destined to become you know, cardiac arrest, non-survivors anyway. We don't have that data just yet for me to say here are the numbers, but what I would say flicker is a poor prognosis in general. And if you're seeing that at the 35 minute mark, unless you have something obvious to offer this patient that you haven't thought of yet, what else is there to do? Great answer. All right. I want to talk about mechanical cardiac therapies like ECMO. We've alluded to this through the, the podcast a little bit, but really... There are a certain subset of patients who might benefit from mechanical cardiac therapies. And for most of us, really the important move, I think, is to simply know when to call the ECMO team or the interventional cardiologist or whoever it is uh, in your jurisdiction to see if the patient might be a good candidate and how to get the patient from your ED to ECMO. I think those are really the key things that our our listeners want to know. So Dr. Weingart, what are, first of all, the indications for mechanical cardiac therapy? You know, I know there's the arrest trial, the inception trial. What can we learn from these trials about who we should send or who we should think about ECMO and get on the phone for? Yeah. So for out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, and I I include patients that die in the ED in that group, uh, it keeps broadening. And we finally have some randomized controlled data coming out of the Yiannopoulos folks in Minnesota um, that would tell you that at least in VFib, VTAC, which is the rhythm they studied, uh, remarkable broadness to who could still be saved. You want a patient who was witnessed. You don't want them to have a prolonged downtime. You want them to have a no-flow time, meaning the time with no CPR at all. In my book, less than five minutes, some protocols would say 10. They should be physiologically young, which means, uh, you know, you could say cut off at 65, 70, 75, but if you show me an 80-year-old that looks like they're 50, do it. If you show me a 50-year-old that looks like 100, maybe not so much. Uh, They should have no uh, end stage comorbidities. And then there's a relative one that we put in there. Uh, a body habit is such that it's going to be very difficult to get them on pump. For me, I'd say still try in those patients. There's no reason to exclude them in my book. If I can't get them on, I can't get them on. But, but that's essentially it. Now you could go beyond VFib, VTAC, and some people would. Certainly if you had a pulmonary embolism patient that died in front of you in the department, like you had the CTA, you knew it, um, 100% those patients should go on pump if they don't respond to thrombolysis. But you know every center is gonna have their own criteria. So the real key is to make a cheat sheet if you have access to eCPR and put it on the desk of that nurse code leader along with all their responsibilities such that people don't have to make this stuff up de novo each time there's a cardiac arrest and then put the phone number you actually call on that sheet as well. All right, great. That's a nice, concise, clear answer. And it seems like the indications are expanding. Then there's the second part of it, which most of us practice where there is no ECMO directly available in your ED. How do you get these patients to ECMO? What are the logistics? What do you need to know? How do you do it? In in most cases, you shouldn't be getting them to ECMO. ECMO should be coming to you. Um, Now, you know, in some places, they'll be going up to the interventional cardiology lab, but that's a very scarce number of places. So it really should be coming to the eMERGE. And, you know, this could be very expensive. It doesn't need to be. When I was at shock trauma, uh, this was less expensive than the hypothermia blankets. And since it has hypothermia built into it, then you you actually would save money putting a patient on uh, eCPR. So I think this is the future. I think we will get better and better at figuring out which patients will benefit and not and start limiting uh, how broadly we apply this. But I think in maybe a decade from now, if a center doesn't have access to this, they probably shouldn't be taking cardiac arrest patients. So I would chime in right there on what Scott said. The question was, how do we get someone who has a cardiac arrest to eCPR? And currently, it's all about having the patients go to the right hospitals if you truly want to make that happen. Because, like, I work in Toronto, and so the the hospitals with eCLS are 20 minutes at most from me. And even then, it's not a feasible activity to have a patient who's actively in cardiac arrest have an ECMO team come and cannulate them. So the conversation, as we get more evidence about the role of eCPR, 
looks further on a regionalized and bypass standpoint, much like we think of strokes and trauma and all these other diseases, STEMIs, like we've already considered this. But if you're a community provider right now uh, and you're working two hours outside of a major city that has ECLS, currently, unfortunately, probably not an area you're going to be dedicating a lot of your mental capacity to just because it's not feasible. All right. I mean, that's a little bit about the future of cardiac arrest care. And I wanted to ask the whole panel about what they think the future of cardiac arrest care is. So one thing is maybe eCPR everywhere. Any other ideas about what we're going to see in the next five or 10 or 15 years with cardiac arrest care? Dr. Gray, let's start with you. What would I say? More art lines, more ultrasound, less epi. Dr. Samard? I think the evidence around dual sequential defibrillation, uh, refractory VF is going to become more clear over the next decade, hopefully a lot sooner than that, in terms of what the evidence for or against it is, what the timing of it should be after the third shock, after the fifth shock, when are you truly in refractory VF? I think that's going to become more clear as as uh, in the near future in terms of just getting some good studies out there showing what the evidence really is. Fantastic. And Dr. Tillman? So I think some of this is going to be moving into a sort of cardiac arrest expert centers to allow for the delivery of all these things we've talked about and for standardization of these therapies, um, especially as they either get more complex or more invasive. I think if we're thinking of what the sort of future looks like and in the meantime, just optimizing how we can do CPR. And yeah, if the machines work better, I'm all for the machines. Someone please make the machine work better so that everyone can get to these large cardiac arrest centers. All right. Yeah. I think you kind of uh, took uh, Weingart's wind there a little bit. I, I know that your vision of the future is cardiac arrest care centers. The future is cardiac arrest centers and I'll piss people off. And that's what I'm here for. No cardiac arrest patient, even now, but certainly 10 years from now should be going to a non-cardiac arrest center. EMS is more than capable of doing the basics. They do it super well. And so you can just terminate in the field. And for patients who have the viability uh, they should be taken to a cardiac arrest center, not just for the cardiac arrest care, but the post-arrest care just can't be done in non-cardiac arrest centers in the way you want to do. Now, if there's a patient who's getting resuscitated who's non-viable, and you just, because of socio uh, issues, can't stop the code in the field, then that's great to take to a community eMERGE. You know, you got to protect the paramedics and EMS folks out there and let them do what they need to do. But cardiac arrest centers should be the future now. Fantastic. So thank you all so much for your expertise your insights. I hope that all these controversies that we've talked about will be a bit clearer in listeners' minds about how they're going to approach their next cardiac arrest patient. I think it's getting so complex now, and we've talked about so much that I just want to drive home what I see as the future of cardiac arrest care, aside from what all these experts are telling us, is in the training. You know, In order to integrate all these wonderful things that these experts have told us, I think we really need to invest in really good training for cardiac arrest care. Everything from communication to putting in art lines to using POCUS to all these great things that we've talked about to uh, ultimately save some more lives. So thank you very much, all of you. It was great to be here again. Thanks. Thanks for the invite and letting me pick some experts' brains while I was here too. Very helpful for me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.